I'm Bob Duhamel. Today we are going to talk about multimeters. A multimeter is the primary instrument that we use to measure electricity. And it's called a multimeter because it can measure voltage, it can measure current, and it can measure resistance. There are two main types of multimeters. We have the analog meter and the digital meter. Now the digital meter is definitely easier to use and more accurate, but there are times when a analog meter is a better choice. So we'll be spending most of our time now talking about the analog meter because it's a little more difficult to read, but once again is useful in certain situations. Uh, those situations would be, for example, if you have a fluctuating voltage. If you have a fluctuating voltage and a digital meter, you get kind of a jumble of numbers that just keeps changing and it's kind of hard to follow where with an analog meter, which of course is needle based, if you look at my finger as being the needle, if you have a fluctuation, well I can see is it fluctuating at a high voltage or a low voltage or middle voltage, get an idea of what you have where it may be a little more difficult with a digital meter. Another thing about an analog meter is you can kind of watch it out of the corner of your eye. A digital meter you have to look directly at and read the numbers, where an analog meter you're looking out the corner of your eye, you can see is it a low voltage, medium voltage, or high voltage. And so you can make a good use out of it in those uh, particular situations. So let's take a look at how an analog meter works first. Your typical analog meter is based on what's called the Darsenval or Darsenval galvanometer. And that is basically an electromagnet, which is a piece of iron that has a coil of wire around it. Now it's not this shape, it's kind of rounded, but I'm just trying to make this for illustration purposes. Here's a, what a galvanometer looks like without its clothes on and get an idea of how it's shaped. But this will work for our illustration purposes. And at this electromagnet is on a pivot, so it's got a shaft here that it can pivot uh, freely. Well, not quite so freely as we'll see in a moment. And I'm going to put a needle on here. Yeah, it's off at an angle, but that'll still give us an idea of what happens. And this is mounted inside some electro, excuse me, some permanent magnets. So the movement is basically a pivoting electromagnet inside some permanent magnets. And so if I run some current through that coil, what's going to happen? I'm going to get a magnetic field around that. We already know that when you run a current through a piece of wire, we get a magnetic field around it. And coiling that concentrates the magnetic field. So we get a electromagnet. Run the current through it, we get a magnetic field. And that works against, I'll put a little N and S here to remind us that those are permanent magnets. The magnetic field of the electromagnet works against the magnetic field of the permanent magnet and causes the uh, magnet, the electromagnet to rotate. Now of course what it would do is just rotate over and hit the end. So what we do is we mount a coil spring on here and it's a precision spring so that we know about you know, how much current we put into the coil, how much this is going to turn against the spring. And the more current we put in, the more it's going to push and so therefore, more current, more deflection of the needle. We have on both ends a couple of stop pegs just to protect the needle. If we put in too much current, it'll hit this stop peg. Or if we happen to hook up the wires backwards, the red and green uh, leads. In the case of an analog meter, if well, we always want to have the red lead at a higher voltage and the black lead, did I say green? may have. We have the red lead at the higher voltage and the black lead at the lower voltage and then the deflection is always clockwise. If we reverse that and have the black lead at the higher voltage and the red lead at the lower voltage, it's going to go the wrong way and this stop peg prevents it from going uh, further the wrong way or more than it should. So one thing we have to remember about an analog meter, which is not quite as important with a digital meter, is to watch the polarity of our leads. Always have the red lead at the higher voltage, otherwise you get a meaningless reading because the needle just goes the wrong way. Now let's say we know that with this particular electromagnet and this particular spring, that at the end of the needle, let's put these marks in black, at the end of the needle, let's say that each of these marks is one millimeter, Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it does about what I want. Uh, let's see, these are a millimeter apart. So we'll put some graduations on here. Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And so the tip deflects one millimeter. We put these marks up here. So what do we decide? That 
this tip deflection is going to be one millimeter per milliamp. So this particular meter is probably a little too uh, easy. Uh, an actual meter might have different numbers, but they work around that. So let's say we have one millimeter per milliamp. And so I put one milliamp of current through here. And what's going to happen? Now these, of course, are bigger than a millimeter, but uh, you get the idea. So I put in one milliamp, I get it deflected by one millimeter. I put in two milliamps, two millimeters, and I just conveniently put the numbers up here and say this measures in milliamps. So instantly, one milliamp meter. There we go. Let's make this a little more readable. So there we have it. A milliamp meter. This reads up to five milliamps. So we get a deflection at the tip of the needle of one millimeter. You now they're kind of close together, but whatever the reading is. So each one of these graduations here represents one milliamp based on the length of the needle, how far apart the graduations are, how tight the spring is, or the, the feedback of the spring, or the uh, resistance of the spring, and all the parameters give us just one milliamp puts us here, two there, three there, four there, five there. And there's a milliamp meter that reads up to five milliamps. And that's your basic Darsenval galvanometer. So uh, how can we have that read voltage? Well, we know that the electromagnet is going to have a certain amount of resistance. So let's say this one here just happens to have one kilo ohm of resistance. So if we have one kilo ohm of resistance, how much voltage is it going to take us to get one milliamp? Well, let's see, good old Ohm's law. If you don't know your voltage, you uh, multiply. So one milliamp times 1,000 ohms is going to be one volt. Isn't that nice and convenient? Because now I see that I also get the same deflection for one volt as I do, well, how do I get that one milliamp? I get it by putting one volt in. So I can calibrate this either in milliamps, say, okay, I put in one milliamp, two milliamps, three milliamps, four milliamps, five milliamps, or I know, well, it takes one volt to get one milliamp. So just as quickly, this is actually a voltmeter. One volt, two volts, three volts, four volts, or five volts. So that's how a Darsenval based analog meter even though it always works off current, it's the current that deflects the needle, we know that, well, it takes a certain amount of voltage, so I can actually make that simply uh, label it in voltage because I know that it's going to be one volt per milliamp, so instead of milliamps, volts. And that's how we can have a meter actually read volts. So while we're at it, how do we measure ohms? Ohms means that we have to have some circuitry out here, including some kind of a power source. So let's just draw a little battery out here. And I'm going to run that battery through some resistance. So, and I simply calibrate it such that I know, well, in this case, if I put a 1K here, hmm, that gives us a total resistance of 2K, Let's put this at 2 volts. So 2K, 2 volts is going to give me aha, 1 milliamp. So this rep represents ohms, doesn't it? No, not quite, because the lower the resistance, the more I'm going to go to the right of the scale. So my scale works backwards. So it's more like... So now I have it calibrated in such a way, well, it turns out that, uh, well, that's not going to work out quite right. Let's see what the numbers are really going to work. Let's see, 2 volts. This is 1K. That's 1K. So two 1K resistances in series. I have 2K, 2 volts, 2K. That's going to give me my 1 milliamp. And that's going to deflect the meter over to here. So actually, I have to label this a little differently zero, and there's 1K right there. So look how that works. It's just a little differently. So a 1K resistor in here, and you know, this would be you know, like my probes. Let's just 
because we can. Well, I didn't need to do that. There's my black lead. I'll draw a little. There is my black lead. And here is my red lead. And so if I put a 1K resistor in there, it gives me 1 milliamp and deflects it to there. So there's my 1K. What if I put a smaller resistor in here? So let's say I put a 500 ohm resistor. Notice what's happened is my resistance has gone down, so the needle is going to deflect further. How much? Well, let's see, it's going to be 1500 ohms instead of 2000 ohms. Well, it actually turns out that if I calculate that out, I'm going to get 1.3 milliamps. Let's just do that in green. So 500 ohms, 1.3 milliamps. So let's see, that's going to move my needle to about maybe here. So now that has to be labeled as 500 ohms. Hmm. It didn't go halfway down, did it? That's because it's, it's going to be like that. As I go, my lower resistances is not going to be a one-to-one -one relationship like the volts and the uh, amps was. So I get a logarithmic scale. So as I get further and further down, actually it's going to be here. It's going to be a, a change in resistance will be so much. But as I go higher and higher in resistance, notice that my scale is going backwards with the resistance. As I go higher and higher in resistance, the needle moves less and less. And so this is maybe 1K, and I get down to about here. That's going to be, you know, maybe 10K. And so let's see, it's 500 ohms. Let's see, about uh, 100 ohms might be around, well, that would be around here, 100 ohms. If we do this with logarithmic scale, if that is a change in 10, then uh, I'm going to have about a change in 10. It's going to be equidistant. Let's just uh, redraw the scale just to uh, maybe be a little, like make it a little easier if I just start from scratch here. So here's zero. Let's say this is 100 ohms. This would be 1K, 10K, 100K. And eventually we get down to infinity. So if we have uh, an infinite amount of resistance, therefore we have zero current. So the needle will be back over here to the what was the zero amps or zero ohms, or excuse me, zero amps or zero volts. So if we have infinite resistance, in other words, an open circuit, this is going to be here at zero, so we get no reading at all, but as we put more and more resistance in, or should I say less and less resistance, this is going to deflect over here. So less resistance means more current, and this deflects to the right. And this is uh, probably, well, this is a more realistic scale. It's logarithmic. Notice that my equal distances go up by a factor of 10, which is the nature of a logarithmic scale. So uh, we'll talk about that in analog uh, electronics pretty far down the road. So here's our ohm scale going backwards, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, on up to an infinite number of ohms. And uh, so that's the way the meter uh, does resistance. So that's basically how the meter works. Let's uh, get rid of some of this clutter here and talk a little more about how to read an analog meter. Let's get some of this clutter out here too and just let's just leave a new scale up here. One, two, three, four, five. We'll make five graduations again. So let's say our meter has a scale that looks something like this. Typically we have the ohm scale up in the top. I'll just leave it the way it is. I won't redraw that. But let's say we have zero. Let's say we have over here to 250, so uh, I'll just leave the one number there. I don't want to try to draw the whole thing and clutter it out. Uh, so I have multiple scales in the analog meter. And so down here, I'm going to have a knob that allows me to look at different uh, voltages. Let's put the pointer on there, and I might have something like, oh, uh, 1,250. 50 and 10 and 2.5 and so I can point this to different parts of the scale now how do I relate that well it's kind of easy here well yeah I guess that would be over here volts make that DC volts so there's my DC volt scale okay so if I point there my maximum reading is 250 volts easy enough if I put it here my maximum reading is 50 volts if I put it here, my maximum reading is 10 volts, so uh, pretty straightforward. But 
What about thousand? Well, there's no thousand volt scale. Well, we just simply have to add two zeros to the ten. So zero, two, one, thousand. We have to use a little bit of imagination. So the ten becomes one thousand volts if we have it here. Excuse me, if we have it up here. And so how about the 2.5 volt range? Let's put the 10 volts back here. Well, then we have to use our imagination and put a decimal point right here. And so we put it on the 2.5 volt range. This goes all the way over to 250, which is now 20, or actually 2.5. And uh, if I was realistic about this, actually, we would most likely have a, let's see, 1,000, 250, 50. We'd probably have a... Uh, 25, and then a 10, and then a, a 5, and a 2.5, you know. So all those possible ranges, maybe, maybe not have them. It depends on your meter. So there's all these different ranges. A uh, 2.5 volt scale, that becomes 2.5. 5, the 50 becomes 5.0. For 10, that's 10, easily enough. And as we said up here, the 1,000, we just have to add two zeros to the 10. So that's how we read the scale, and we just have to match the scale match the range to the scale and whatever we have in the middle there. And so that would also do for whatever readings we have because we might have over here AC volts. And uh, usually not as many readings, but we might have uh, uh, 1,000. Well, let's just draw it down here. Let's say we have here as 1,000. And here is... Uh, uh, you know, 250 and then maybe 25, I don't know, whatever the meter does, it, that should be 250. Let's just put a 10 here just because we can, but the scales might not be as straightforward as that, but once again, we put it on the AC volts. Works the same way. On the 1000 volt scale, we are at the two zeros here. The 250 volt scale, there we are. 10 volt scale, there we are. So that's how you uh, read the uh, the voltage current is same thing although we might have something like uh oh how about 250 milliamps and uh maybe uh thousand uh, analog meters don't tend to do what i was about to do there we'll see that on digital meters let's say one amp and uh that's kind of kind of high for some meters that's probably more like 2.5 milliamps and maybe 10 milliamps and maybe uh, 250 milliamps uh, kind of scales we would typically have in our analog meter we might also have a high current scale where maybe we have something that says oh how about uh, mm, a 10 amp scale now typically Notice these are pretty small and that's pretty big. So what we're going to see is some inputs on the side. And one will say common, or COM. And this will say volts, amps, ohms. And this one might say 10 amps. So I have a different place to put my leads. So my black lead always goes in the one that says common. It might even be a negative sign next to it. And then normally for almost all my readings, my red lead would go into the VA and ohms, volts, amps, and ohms. But if I want to read the 10 amp scale, I have to take my red lead out of here and put it in here. So it's a special place to put it. And what that does is it will have a, a bar of metal, just a huge chunk of metal that has a known resistance and a very low resistance. And in fact, uh, if I erase this and go back to my meter movement, I'll leave out the magnets. So uh, I'm going to have my bar of metal basically going from the, I'll just draw the two holes here. Here's my common, and here's my 10 amp reading. So when I'm on that 10 amp reading, I just have the straight bar of metal there. Is that a short circuit? You betcha. Pretty much a short circuit, but there's going to be a lead off here somewhere. Sometimes there might be a resistor on it going to there and this is soldered in just the right place so that when I get my 10 amps going through here it picks off um, well if we look at the scale we had before just to simplify things 
zero, one, two, three, four, five. There's my five milliamp. Well, it was milliamps. That's actually, mm, let's put zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, you might have a scale, something like that. Usually it's the ohms across the top, but we'll, we'll leave it as it is. So why didn't I erase that? Because, like I already showed, the analog meters have multiple scales. So if it's a 10 amp scale, that already gives you a hint that, oh, there's, there's my 10 amps. And so what I'm going to do is, well, what they do is they pick this off here just such that I'm going to get, uh, let's see, it took 5 milliamps. So I get 5 milliamps to go that way. And the rest of my 10 amps, which is going to be 9.995 amps, is going to go that way. So that's what you have in there. So remember, when you're using the high current range of a meter, whether it's a digital or analog meter, remember that that's a dead short in there. So take it back out and put it back where it belongs immediately so you don't accidentally go poking that somewhere else and be shorting things out. Uh, in fact, one time I was going to do a demonstration in my classroom and I hooked up my meter and I had left it with the red lead in the 10 amp range and I didn't watch what I was doing. I set the scale to uh, the 200 volt range and I was going to show that you could use a meter safely to measure the high voltage coming out of the wall. So I held up the two leads and said, observe as the fearless technician plunges the leads into the wall socket. Red lead here black lead here, dead short. Yes, the smoke came out. Didn't, didn't I still have the meter lead somewhere that I, I melted a little bit on doing that. So uh, yeah, uh, be careful about that. Always take it and put it back in the regular range when you're done because remember that's a dead short. Uh, so you want to be careful about that. So that's the uh, way the, the high current range on your typical um, meter is going to work, whether it's an analog or a digital meter. And so that's the basic inner workings of your analog meter. One other thing I want to talk about, especially since we're talking about this, we have a scaling issue here. We want to be able to read 10 amps on a meter that can only handle 5 milliamps. Well, that's how we do it. We just have a shorting bar there and just tap this in just such a place so that we get our 5 milliamps going that way and the rest going that way. And that's how the meter does different scales. So this meter always is going to have a maximum of 5 milliamps. Remember, one milliamp moves it this far, two moves it that far, three, four, and five. So no matter what I'm measuring, I have five milliamps going through the meter to get my full deflection. So the way the meter gets different ranges, well, let's uh, just to simplify it. So there's my five milliamps. How would I change this so that it reads 50 milliamps? Well, what I'm going to have is a circuit in here. So here's my... I'll draw this in red because I can. My red lead from my volts, amps, and ohms, remember you don't want to leave it in that 10 amp range, comes in and I'm going to end up with essentially a uh, circuit where I have a resistor bypass my, uh, my coil. Remember we saw this was 1K? Well, what if I have a 1K resistor here? That means I'm going to get, if I send in 5 milliamps, which should give me a full scale deflection, well, what's going to happen if this is 1K and that's 1K, I'm going to get 2.5 milliamps going that way and 2.5, let's get that out of the way, milliamps going that way. So if I have this a 1K resistor with my 1K coil in parallel, Half my current goes here, so only half of my current goes up there, so my 5 milliamps is only going to bring me up to about here. So now it takes 10 milliamps to get my full deflection. So now with the 10 milliamps going there, I'm going to get 5 milliamps going that way, 5 milliamps going that way, and so that's 10 milliamps is going to deflect me full deflection. So I have to use a different scale. So that's going to be 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. That's why the meters have multiple scales. So now what I've done is I've turned my knob 10 milliamps. And so now my full scale is 10 milliamps. And what I've simply done is just put a 5 milliamp resistor in parallel with my 
uh, with my electromagnet. And so now the 10 milliamps coming in gives me 5 milliamps going that way, 5 going that way, deflects at full scale, and I read my 10 milliamps. So the way this knob on the meter actually works, get that out of the way, move the clutter out here, is I have a switch that switches in uh, different, let's see, here we go, different resistors. So there's my common volts, amps, and ohms. And so I have that switch that switches in different resistors to give me the different scales. So that's how the how that works. They just simply, uh, let's see, did I draw this wrong? Uh, yes, I did. Because remember, we want to have those in parallel. Here, let's just draw it this way. Here's my volts, amps, and ohms, comes in, there we go. So I have the 1K there, and we have some other resistors. That's better. There's my common, here's my switch, not very well drawn, but my switch switches in different resistors to give us different ranges. So. Uh, switch in a 1K resistor to make the 10 amp range, another resistor to give a different range. And that's the basic idea of how a meter works. Before we move on, what about alternating current? Let's just erase that. Of course, what we have to do for alternating current is we have to have a diode in there to rectify it. And this is why your alternating current scale might not match these. It depends on the meter. But so with the, with the diode, we have our Our volts, amps, amps, and ohms, and the diode comes here and rectifies it because, of course, what's going to happen if we put alternating current into that electromagnet? Let's redraw that. So here's the electromagnet with its little pivot point and the needle and the there's the magnets, the permanent magnets. So if I put an alternating current, what's going to happen? The current goes this way. Needle wants to deflect this way. Then the current reverses, and the needle wants to deflect that way. What do I get? The needle just sits there and vibrates. In fact, it might not even be noticeable how much it moves. So what we're going to have to do to measure alternating current is put in a diode so that only the current going one direction, so the current only goes one direction, and we, uh, we'll put in some uh, shunt resistors in here once again, and we'll carefully choose those resistors so that we get meaningful readings when we have that diode in series. Might be a little oversimplified, but that's what we have to do to get AC readings is to have a diode in there. So I think I've covered the basic idea of how the analog meter works. Um, quite a bit. Uh, now, when we measure uh, voltage, what do we do? We take our two leads and we put them across two places in the circuit. Remember, the voltmeter tells us the difference in voltage between the two leads. So that's pretty straightforward. How about measuring current? Well, to measure current, the meter has to become part of the circuit. So let's draw a circuit here. Just a real simple circuit with a voltage source and a load. And to measure my voltage somewhere, well, let's just put another load in here just to make some variety. Not a load, but another resistor here to give us some variety. If I take my meter and I put it here, I measure the voltage there. If I put my meter here, I measure the voltage there. Simple enough. But how do I measure the current? I have to actually break the circuit, and then the meter... becomes part of the circuit. So measuring current is intrusive with your typical current meter. So measuring voltage, just put the leads somewhere and measure the voltage, send it to the right range first. Measuring current, I do have to break the circuit and put the meter in there to measure current. Now there are non-intrusive current meters. Current clamps, as they're sometimes called, you can clamp it around a wire and it measures the magnetic field around the wire.
but those are a little more expensive. They're becoming less expensive. They're not a, incredibly uncommon, but uh, you can find those now. But your typical analog meter, you must break the circuit in order to measure current. So that's the basic idea of how you do that. And last but not least, measuring resistance. Uh, once again, the meter itself has a battery in there. So your meter, your analog meter, even though it's a passive device that can measure voltage and current without any kind of electronics, to measure resistance, you must have a battery in there because what does the meter actually do? We have a battery, puts that voltage across a resistance, and the meter measures the current. And so, as I showed before, uh, we can put certain resistors in parallel and with the right switching, we can get the right scale. Uh, look back earlier in the video, so I don't have to redo that, but we can get a, a scale depending on what uh, that particular resistance is. So the problem is with an analog meter, we need to make an adjustment. So I'm gonna put, this is probably a little oversimplified, but there's gonna be a variable resistor in there. And so when you measure resistance with an analog meter, the first thing you do is you put the two leads together and short it out to give a zero resistance. Your scale is going to go all the way over. And so here's our scale. And the needle is going to go all the way over to the zero. And it's going to overshoot or undershoot or something. And you adjust this until you get zero. Then you take the leads apart then put them across the resistor you're measuring. Remember not to measure in a circuit with power in involved because that can uh, damage the, the meter when you're in the ohms range. And also if you're measuring high resistances, don't be holding the resistor in your hand as you put the leads across it. And that's especially true for high resistances again because then you're putting your body resistance across there and you're going to skew the reading. So small resistances doesn't make a difference. So if it's like 100 ohms, 500 ohms, you can probably hold it in your hand and hold the leads to the uh, meter. But if you're measuring a much bigger resistance, make sure you're not touching it and somehow get that resistor on there without your putting your fingers in there so that you don't become part of the resistance you're trying to measure. And one last thing is whenever you're using a meter, always set the meter to the highest range So if I'm going to measure voltage and I don't know what my, I have no idea what the voltage is, set that to the highest range and see what we have because it's much better to be expecting 25 volts and have the meter up at 1,000 volts and you put it there, oops, it was 500 volts. <laughs> uh, much better to have that happen than to put this down to like 25 volts and find out that it's actually 500 volts. It's going to drive the needle over to the peg and could damage the needle. So always sit to your highest range then work your way down. Now there are auto ranging meters that you can't do this. Some meters are much simplified. <laughs> Volts, amps, or ohms. Those are auto ranging meters where it figures things out for itself so it's obviously not a part of using the meter but most of them put to the highest range and then work your way down. One thing I forgot to mention Let's go back to the analog meter for just a moment, is accuracy. So let's say our meter, your good meters might have an accuracy of 2%, which means let's say this is 100 volts. That means if I'm all the way at full scale and it reads 100 volts, it could be 98 volts or it could be 102 volts. So uh, we have that um, to deal with. And also a thing to deal with with analog meters is parallax. So if I take these two pins and line them up and I move my head, then I'm going to see the pins move. That's called parallax. And the same thing happens here when I look at that. If I move my head back and forth, it's going to change where the meter is, where the needle is appears to be. So I need to look at it straight on. In fact, your better analog meters have a little mirror along the scale so that you can see your needle. And if you see two needles in the mirror, you need to move your head until they line up and you only see one and that gives you your most accurate reading. Once again, if it's a 2% meter and I'm reading 100 volts, it could be anywhere from 98 to 102 volts. But what happens if I come down here to 10 volts? That 2% is all the way up here at this end of the scale. So my 2% is an area about 
that wide. If I go down here, it's the same area, the same length. So my 2% at 10% of my scale is actually going to be considerably, well, it's still going to be a couple of volts. So this could be 100, and, this could be 98 volts to 102 volts. This could be 8 volts to 12 volts, still a 4 volt range there. And that's a much bigger percent. So if it's a 2% accuracy here, it's a 20% accuracy down here. So with an analog meter, you always want to do your readings toward the high end of the scale if you can. So now let's talk about a digital meter. Now, as I mentioned with an analog meter, the analog meter always responds to current. So the meter itself always measures current, but we can label that in volts because we know how much voltage it takes to get a certain amount of current and put the right resistors in there. We can get the right scale and we can read voltage or we can read current. And with a battery in there, as I showed, we could read ohms. A digital meter works by having a voltage controlled oscillator. So our meter probe comes into the voltage controlled oscillator, which gives us a particular frequency based on the voltage. And that goes into a counter. And then that goes to our display. And so uh, if we put, let's say, 1.234 volts here. The counter goes to a certain frequency. This counts and may usually like uh, maybe uh, 1.234 kilohertz. I'm making this up, but it's a realistic number. And the counter puts a 1, 2, 3, 4 up there. And uh, it's scaled so that says, OK, that's 1.234 volts. So you're digital meter always works off voltage. So like the analog meter is actually always measuring current, but we can extrapolate voltage from that. The digital meter always measures voltage, but there's a way to extrapolate current out of that I'll talk about in a moment. So one thing about a digital meter is it's more accurate. Uh, back to the analog meter real quickly. Remember that we have to worry about the accuracy, which might be 2% on a good meter, and the further down the scale, the less accurate it gets. 1% uh, accuracy digital meters and better are not uncommon at all. In fact, your cheapest meters probably have about a 1% accuracy. So digital meters are much more accurate. And of course, they're easier to read because you just look at the number. You don't have to worry about, okay, what's my scale? Do I have, you know, a, a 250 over here? And my scale says uh, 2.5 milliamps is my maximum. So I have to have, imagine a decimal point there. Digital meters don't have anything like that, but they have their own anomalies. So you might have readings such as here's our knob that points toward different scales, and we have 2,000 volts, 200 volts, uh, 20 volts. Notice the theme going on here, uh, 2 volts. Hmm. Let's look at our typical scale on a digital meter and find out why that is. Our typical scale will probably have uh, I'm just going to try to draw these as seven segment displays, but I'll just draw them as zeros. One, two, three, and a one. That's what it's capable of uh, displaying. The first most significant digit is only able to display a one or nothing. So let's say we put in here 900, um, in the case of 900 volts, that's a lot of volts, but um, let's say we're over here on milliamps. Two milliamps. 20 milliamps, 200 milliamps, 2,000 milliamps. I don't know why. I'd just rather do milliamps right now. So let's put in 900 milliamps. It's going to read 900 with no, no leading zero. So, so that's 0.9 amps or 900 milliamps. And so we know that's reading milliamps. So easy enough. Let's go up to 1,000 milliamps. Now that one is going to get activated and we get our zeros in there. And why does it do this? Because 2,000 milliamps, what is that? That's two amps. So 2,000 milliamps equals two amps. Why do they do that? I actually don't know. There's probably a logical reason, but that's what they do. Maybe it's because just the psychology of reading the meter, because what's that going to give us? Well, actually, the funny thing is, the meter can't give us 2,000 milliamps. The best it can do is 1,999. So it's going to be one short. 
So I can't even actually read the 2,000 milliamps because one milliamp short. Why did they do that? I really don't know. But anyway, put this on the, here at the 2,000 milliamp mark, which means we're measuring two amps. The high, or the maximum we can measure is two amps. The highest number we can get is 1,999 milliamps, or actually what that is is 1.999 amps. Maybe they do this so they don't have to put a decimal point up there. It's good a reason as any. But anyway, uh, 2,000 milliamps gives us 1.999 milliamps, which is 1.999 amps. And that's kind of the anomaly of how you read these meters. And so notice that each one of these uh, ends in a, or begins with a 2, to remind us of how that meter is being read. But you cannot read 2,000 volts. You can read 1,999. Uh, two volt scale, it would just put a decimal point there, which kind of defeats the purpose of why. Oh, actually it wouldn't, because I know what that would be. That'd actually be the two thousand millivolt scale. That's very typical. Once again, I think they're trying to avoid putting a decimal point up there for whatever reason. So 2,000 millivolts is what? 2,000 millivolts equals 2 volts. So once again, we can get a maximum of 1.999 volts. We have to say, okay, that's actually 1,999 volts. Imagine my decimal point there to make it 1.999 volts. So that's a little bit of an anomaly of uh, reading a digital meter. But they're very straightforward. And also when you're reading uh, resistance, you don't have to do the zeroing. You just touch the leads to your resistor and get your reading. So none of the fiddling around of a analog meter. Much, much easier to use. So what's going to happen if we go over 1.999 uh, amps or 1.999 volts or 1,999 millivolts. Let's uh, move this over to the 200 milliamp range, in which case we have to put a decimal point here. So now the highest thing we can read is uh, 199.9 milliamps. So we're on the milliamp scale. We look there, we're 200 milliamps max, we're at 100 199.9 milliamps, the highest we can read. What happens if we go all the way to, to uh, 200 milliamps? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to show us an overrange. So our one milliamp too many, or one tenth of a milliamp too many in this case, and our zeros disappear and we get just a one. That means we're over range. And so what we have to do now is move our range control to the next higher range. So now we're at the 2000 milliamp range and now we'll get a meaningful reading. In this case, let's say it went up to about, oh, let's say um, 203 milliamps. So we can't read 203 milliamps in the 200 milliamp range. The highest we can read is uh, 199.9 milliamps. So we get the one with blanks means go to the next range, and now it reads 203. So that's how we deal with uh, the different ranges. So once again, you see the zeros disappear, your over range, move your knob to the next higher range. Another thing about uh, digital meters, I mentioned with analog meters, you have to be mindful of how you put the probes. You have to always have the red probe at the higher voltage and the black probe at the lower voltage. Uh, if you reverse them, then the needle goes the wrong way and you don't get a meaningful reading. In the case of a digital meter, you don't have to be so um, uh, mindful of that because what's going to happen, let's say I'm measuring some voltage. This can happen with current too because uh, current has direction. Uh, but I'll just continue going to voltage here. Let's say we're on the uh, 20 volt range. So that's now 20.3 volts. And let's say I flip the lead so that the black lead is at the higher voltage. What happens? I just get a minus sign. That might be why I was just trying to figure out why do they never have a complete um, a digit over here? They always have just a one. Well, that leaves room for the minus sign because if we had a complete digit, we'd have to have a bigger display to squeeze the minus sign in. So your typical digital meter can only show a one for the most significant digit. And uh, so here we have, it can't show a zero, so nothing's there. 
and we just have a minus sign if we reverse the leads and of course we put them back where they're supposed to go then the minus sign disappears so that's uh, another thing about digital meter you don't have to quite be so careful about where you put your leads so which is better analog or digital of course the digital meter is almost always uh, better and more accurate and easier to use but sometimes with a fluctuating voltage you might want that analog meter so you can watch the needle fluctuate or if you uh, want to be able to just look out at the corner of your eye then an analog meter is also better than a digital because you don't have to actually look and resolve the numbers so there's your basic how your analog and digital meters work is when it comes to actually using them there's a little more we can say we'll talk about that a little bit later if you found this video useful and informative please give me a thumbs up down below it really helps the channel and subscribe because that not only informs you when i put new videos up but it really helps the channel also and a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible and a big thank you to everyone for watching.